Hello. In this talk, I'd like to take you into a piece of cultivated nature, not the wild nature of hills and coasts, or even the agricultural landscapes of productivity that Patricia talked about in her, her, her talk, but a garden, the kind of domesticated nature, in other words, that became hugely popular in the 19th century as what was called the great horticultural movement got underway. This made gardens places for popular leisure and personal enjoyment with ideas of decoration and beauty to the fore. And it resulted essentially from advances in science. Hybridization, for example, that drew on Darwin's experiments, enabled ever more colorful, showy, or strongly scented plants and flowers to be developed. And this trend was fueled also by the discovery and importation of exotic plants from overseas. In that process, ward cases, special boxes with glass sides named after their early 19th century inventor, Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward, enabled living plants and not just seeds to be brought from distant places. Whilst greenhouses, invented in turn in the 19th century, meant that the new exotic plants could be overwintered and young plants brought on. So gardens positively exploded with the results of all this science. With his belief that nature as such was, quote, always wrong, and that it was the job of the artist to be her master, we might expect Whistler to have been innately attracted to gardens as sources of artistic inspiration. Gardens, after all, whether boosted by science or not, are pieces of nature organized by human hand. And as such, they're traditionally perceived as a form of art in themselves. Whistler's friend and colleague, Claude Monet, for example, was to call his garden at Giverny, my most beautiful work of art, even though it was filled with new hybrid colored water lilies and all manner of other examples of modern scientific horticulture. Intriguingly, however, Whistler did not really give much attention to gardens until the last decade of his career, after his marriage in 1888 to Beatrix Godwin, in his new state of married bliss, he seems to have discovered a rich new stimulus in the private gardens that Beatrix created for him. First in Chelsea, here's a, a view that he did, um, a little lithograph of 21 Chain Walk, the garden there with friends, and then in turn at the Rue du Bac in Paris, where he lived with Beatrix from 1892 until her untimely death in 1896. And the other uh, picture on the screen is a, a portrait by Whistler of Beatrix and her sister Ethel in the garden of 110 Rue du Bac, Paris, uh, again a lithograph. Whistler also began at this period to discover the rich social milieu of the public garden in daytime, not the nocturnal revelry of Cremorne and pleasure gardens where he painted the falling rocket that provoked Ruskin's ire, but the wit, joy, poignancy even of nursemaids flirting, children playing, little old ladies gossiping, whether in Kensington Gardens and St. James's Park in London, as in the slide on, on the right, or in the Jardin du Luxembourg in Paris in the 1890s with its statues and formal terraces. Indeed, in the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris, he also weighed up the respective merits of etching and lithography, as if a scientist conducting experiments doing the subjects first in etching, then in lith lithography or vice versa, comparing, contrasting the different opportunities the two media offered for his um, quest to capture these little scenarios of contemporary life in, in the park. This use of the garden as a form of artistic laboratory clearly echoes Whistler's vision in his 10 o'clock lecture of 1885 that he'd given interestingly in Cambridge as well as in London and Oxford. He said in that, that the artist is born to pick and choose and group with science the various aspects of nature that attract his sensibility. And we can see in turn Whistler's own garden at the Rue du Bac as part of the tradition that had developed in the 19th century, century, notably at the hands of the Impressionists, of the artist's garden, a visual laboratory of the artist's own for capturing at first hand the effects of outdoor color and light. 
Even before the Impressionists, John Constable had used his garden at Hampstead Heath in, in London to record sky and weather as part of his principle that, as he called it, as he put it, painting is a science and an inquiry into the laws of nature. However, I want to focus today on the Whistler's Garden at the Rue du Bac that we see on the screen at the moment, not just as a place of visual stimulus, but also a place of sound. I want to argue that working out of doors there amidst the sun, yes, the, the bright colours, the, the, the light, but also amidst sounds, Whistler produced some of his most personal and subtly toned works, works indeed that he called Songs on Stone. That was the name he gave to his series of lithographs in Paris that included um, his garden views, also uh, his uh, views in, in the Jardin du Luxembourg. And by looking at these works and the sounds that he would have heard whilst uh, making them through the lens of sound as well as sight, and through the lens of Charles Darwin's theories as well, we can, I believe, understand more fully Whistler's ideas in his 10 o'clock lecture. For in that lecture, Whistler had said, quote, nature sings her exquisite song to the artist alone, her son and her master. And he had also argued that nature, the songstress, provided the artist with what he called a choice selection of brilliant tones and delicate hints, suggestions of future harmonies. So there's that word of sound, music, harmony. And it was the job of the artist, he, he went on to um, develop in his argument, uh, to seize these suggestions in the same way that, quote, the musician gathers his notes and forms his chords until he bring forth from chaos glorious harmony. We've got a kind of double song here, in other words, the one that nature makes, plus the harmony that the artist then synthesizes from that to make a new expressive song called art. When he gave his 10 o'clock lecture in 1885, nature's song had lain primarily for Whistler in the subtle visual tones of foggy or nocturnal London. But in Paris in the 1890s, the brilliant light and luminous shadows of his summer garden, as well as its association with Beatrix, arguably moved nature's song into a new key for him. So to get into the science of all this and the sounds of the garden, let's go for a stroll with Whistler and his wife Beatrix in their garden at 110 Rue du Bac, a street on the left bank of Paris that still exists today and that runs south from Musée d'Orsay. And we'll let the poet Stéphane Mallarmé step along with us. Mallarmé was the friend of Whistler who had translated the 10 o'clock lecture into French in 1888 and often visited uh, the Rue du Bac garden uh, to, to see the Whistlers. The garden at the Rue du Bac seems to have been an essentially old fashioned place, a long narrow strip of land behind the Whistler's ground floor apartment with a few modern um, aspects nonetheless, uh, a circular area of grass, um, that was quite a fashionable trope for a, a garden in those days, uh, lots of mature trees and what one visitor described as masses of roses seemingly growing semi wild, uh, but roses of course were flowers that had become immensely popular in course of the great horticultural movement and, and very much developed by horticulturalists uh, at the period. These are winter views, they're all we have, but fascinating nonetheless of the Whistler's Garden. And you can see there are things that might be perhaps roses um, cut down in, in winter time. Uh, you can certainly see the curve of the circular lawn and you can see all these trees round about. Indeed, one of the photos is actually labeled showing woodland gateway as if part of the garden perhaps gave onto some relic of the grounds of the Abbé au Bois, Bois being woods, of course, in French, that had originally occupied the district. A lithograph by Whistler of the view from the house to the garden certainly depicts a very old fashioned form of horticulture. However, there's no sign of a lawnmower here. Instead, there's a hired labourer scything thick grass in the dazzle of the sun. If Mallarmé dubbed Beatrix Whistler the Lady of the Garden, Lawn and Blackbird in one of his letters, then her lawn was clearly rather more rustic than manicured, a logical partner to the garden's masses of roses and woodland gate. However, 
uh, as I say, there were a few elements of the Whistler's Garden that definitely were up to date. And I'd like to turn to two of these next as we work our way towards the garden sounds. The first is the exotic plant we see in this picture here, a dragon plant or drachina. It's in a pot in the shelter of the back door porch, and we look past it to, to the man scything the lawn. Drakina had to be wintered indoors, hence the pot, hence the sheltered position, and they were all the rage in 1890s Paris. But even before this, we can, I think, see one being grown by Beatrix's own father, John Boney Philip, the sculptor, in the garden of her childhood home at Merton Villa in London. There it is, rather proudly displayed in the centrepiece of a, a flower bed. Um, we can also spot one in a pot again in Monet's garden at Argenteuil near Paris in the 1870s. So clearly they were being grown by the 1890s, they're being talked about as the fashionable plant to have in your um, house or, or outdoors in the summer in the garden. Drachina plants came originally from South Africa, so they're prime examples of the great horticultural movement bringing uh, exotic new things back to Europe. But the 19th century French novelist Emile Zola vividly described their leaves as looking like, quote, blades of old lacquer which is rather a mixed up metaphor since lacquer evokes the Orient perhaps rather than Africa. But the idea of the Orient is in fact where things begin to make sense at the Rue du Bac. For the porch through which we are looking in this image of the man scything the, the unruly lawn <laughs> was designed by Beatrix and you can see it's made of lattice work. The other picture shows it from the other direction looking towards the house. And again, you can make out the lattice effect. It's lattice work structure essentially reflects the taste for Japanese art and architecture in the late 19th century that Whistler had of course eagerly espoused. Here's the Japanese house with its open work design that had attracted much acclaim at the Paris Universal Exhibition of 1889, for example, you can see the, the lattice work effects. It's thus only logical that another of Whistler's friends and visitors in Paris, the writer and ice seat Count Robert de Montesquieu, gave him and Beatrix the second piece of fashionable modern horticulture that I want to note in their garden, though sadly Whistler didn't leave any um, illustration of, of it. Uh, this was two miniature bonsai trees grown by none other than Hatawa Suke, the Japanese gardener at the Universal Exhibition of 1889. And Montesquieu gave these uh, two bonsai plants uh, to the Whistlers and joked that one of them was, quote, a horticultural fetus, a little monster. All pruning by Wazuke, he implied, had reduced it to something embryonic, even primal, as if the Urpflanz, or first of all trees, was now set to grow in the Whistlers garden. Back, however, to things oriental, for Beatrix's porch also, of course, would have revived the use of trellis or latticework effects in the 18th century picturesque or Anglo-Chinese garden style. That was very popular with the French fin de siècle artistic and literary crowd to whom both de Montesquieu and Mallarmé introduced the Whistlers in Paris. The writer Edmond de Goncourt, for example, installed similar lattice work in his garden just the year after Beatrix put hers in. And we know that de Goncourt owned Claude Henri Watelet's 18th century treatise on horticulture, in which trellising is praised for the effects of surprise it creates. You can only partly see through it, so you have to guess. It's essentially a veil across our sight in the same basic sense as Whistler's London and Venice fogs, and its pleasure comes from half seeing, half imagining. So here's Whistler's lithograph again, looking towards and from uh, Beatrix's latticework porch. You can see the trachina, as I've mentioned, and you can see another interesting lattice feature, in, in essence anyway, a little jardiniere here and also here that Beatrix herself had designed and in which she grew some kind of trailing plant. Here's a lithograph by Whistler of her with her jardiniere, and the, there's a sort of lots of 
flowers and leaves trailing out of it. Uh, my guess is that this plant she's growing uh, is actually perhaps nasturtium. Flowers of nasturtium meant the fires of love in the 19th century language of flowers. Whistler certainly called this picture rather wittily after Raphael's famous painting of the Madonna and Child and St. John in a field of flowers, La Belle Jardinière in the Louvre, as if to play, as if to pay implicit tribute to Beatrix. So if we imagine these as nasturtiums that she's growing, then uh, she's perhaps returning compliment with flowers that stood for love's passion. Incidentally, nasturtiums are old fashioned cottage garden flowers. So again, they're not really part of the modern great horticultural movement, having been introduced to Europe in the late 15th, early 16th century, but uh, they take their place with those uh, more old fashioned dimensions that I've mentioned, uh, apparently um, evident in, in the Rudubat garden. However, I don't want to linger on flowers too long, though the trailing nasturtiums are, of course, another kind of veil or curtain through which we glimpse rather than see clearly. And with the Whistler's lithograph, of course, intensifies this effect with its haze of delicate touches and marks that suggest rather than state a key principle also of Mallarmé's poetry. That was his phrase. Instead, I want to show you some more latticework effects at the Rue du Bac Garden. Again, the work of Beatrix. Here they are. Seats that she designed, and here they're being occupied by her newly married sister and brother-in-law and their families. And you can see the lattice ends to them, the backs as well. And here again, and that's Whistler in the centre. Yes, there we are. <laughs> here again is latticework in turn in the form of bird cages. And these also were designed by Beatrix, having observed uh, examples of them in the Luxembourg gardens. Uh, she made them for the collection of birds that she kept at the Rue du Bac. And on the right, we see a further trellis work designed by her for uh, trellising along the terrace of Whistler's studio, which was in a separate part of Paris, not far away, in fact, in the Rue Notre Dame des Champs. So you can begin to get the picture. The Rue du Bac Garden was a place whose porch, latticework, trellising, seats and jardiniere worked together as a sequence of openwork structures through which light and air penetrated, even as they gave support and protection to humans, animals and plants alike. We wouldn't keep birds in small cuts small cages today, but that's what was done in the 19th century. And this is a drawing by Whistler of Beatrix tending her birds. You can just see the cages um, sketched out. Uh, she's holding out her hand towards one of them. And here's the drachina again, bang in the foreground. Well, birds, of course, sing. So we're beginning to get towards the sounds of the garden. And with its openwork structures, the garden must have answered almost directly to the description by a critic of the day of the Japanese house at the Universal Exhibition of 1889, with its delicate openwork structure as being, quote, like a pretty aviary. Whistler himself, as, as I've mentioned, was one of the most eager aficionados of Japanese art, writing at the end of his 10 o'clock lecture that, Quote, the story of the beautiful had first been broidered with the birds upon the fan of Hokusai at the foot of Fuziyama. His Rudu back garden, thanks to Beatrix then, clearly took this association of Japan, birds and beauty a step further. Beatrix kept parrots and mockingbirds there, and she was also given two Shama Merrill birds from India by the art collector Charles Freer, with the blackbird also, with which, as we've seen, Mallarmé associated Beatrix, the garden must, in short, have been absolutely filled with birdsong. The Sharma Merrells had a particularly sweet song. It's a little unclear whether they were Indian blue rock thrushes, which were regularly imported into Britain from India right up to the 1970s, in fact, on account of their song, and which, according to the 19th century ornithologist Colonel Sykes, were termed Sharma in Hindustani, or whether they were Copsicus macrurus or Malabaricus, the white rump charmer that lived in parts of India and also Asia. Well, Charles Darwin corresponded with Sykes, the ornithologist, 
He also exchanged letters with another ornithologist, Edward Blythe, about the distinctive colouring of the Indian blue rock thrush, the Hindustani Sharma. And it was, at least in part, through his correspondence with these ornithologists that Darwin had gathered important evidence for the chapter on birds in his book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, first published in 1871. In this book, he argued that sexual selection drove evolution and that the colours and calls of birds were a function of their mating rituals and therefore at the heart of the evolutionary process. It was in The Descent of Man, moreover, that Darwin developed the argument that the calls of birds were not just random noise, but music, as melodious as human singing because they were geared to attracting the opposite sex and defending territory to allow liaison with the opposite sex. Poets and birds had referred to the song of birds long, poets and writers had referred to the song of birds long before Darwin, of course. We only need to read the popular ditties of the 19th century singer Paolo Tosti, whom Whistler loved to hear to find this metaphorical kind of literary tradition of birds as songsters. But now, with Darwin, there was a scientific justification for the music of birds as an essential element in the process of evolution that had shaped humankind itself. We don't have any record of Whistler ever meeting Darwin, though his mother Anna may well have done inadvertently. She had frequented the cold baths at Malvern, where Darwin also went. But Whistler definitely knew Darwin's work. He had joked, after all, in 1888, that his own resignation from the Society of British Artists was, quote, the survival of the fittest. And as the art historian Linda Merrill has noted, the fight between the peacocks and Whistler's peacock room decorations is surely an allusion to Darwin's theory of the survival, the struggle of, of the fittest, and not just Whistler's dispute with his patron Leyland. By the 1890s, Whistler's circle of acquaintances certainly included Darwinists such as Edwin Ray Lancaster, professor of zoology at UCL and Oxford, whilst Carl Hagenbeck himself, the noted zookeeper and Darwin follower, delivered the Sharma birds to Beatrix in Paris. However, Darwin's descent of man, as I've mentioned, now gave a place in evolution to something beautiful and harmonious, the music of birds. The bird song at the Rue du Bac um, would have made, would have helped anyway, to make it the calming place in which, according to Whistler's pupil Edmund Verpel, the artist licked his wounds from hostile critics and patrons. In his roses, Verpel tells us Whistler buried his troubles. Verpel also recalled that when tired after work, Whistler would be summoned by Beatrix to advise on one of her birds or an ailing rosebush and, quote, childlike, he would follow her into the garden and they would walk back and forth arm in arm until his mood was changed. The garden, in other words, was an emotionally effective milieu, just as Darwin argued that organisms responded physically to their environment. The bird song would have been all part of the garden's affect. Human songs were also to be heard there, religious ones that drifted over the garden wall from the foreign missionaries' chapel next door. The foreign missionaries' seminary dated back to the 17th century, and their garden next to the Whistlers was actually estimated to be the largest private garden in Paris. Listen to Beatrix describing the missionary's songs in a letter to the art dealer Edward Guthrie Kennedy of 19th July 1893. The monks are at this moment singing a farewell to one of them who is going to China. We have both got the blues, for they are making the most doleful sounds. Given the circumstance here, the departure on mission of one of the monks, we can in fact identify the doleful sounds as actually music by the French 19th century composer Charles Gounod, who had been organist at the Missions Étrangères, the foreign missionaries, in the 1850s. Gounod's song for the departure of the missionaries was traditionally sung at their chapel, next door to the Whistlers, whenever one of them went overseas. 
The monks singing must have been particularly evocative as it mingled with the bird song and the scent of roses. De Montesquieu certainly recorded that it made, as he put it, a very great impression on him. Whilst chanting from a nearby monastery features in the fictitious garden of the sculptor Gloriani in Henry James's novel, The Ambassadors, that was inspired by James's visits to the Whistler's Paris garden. James, of course, like his brother, the pioneer psychologist, William James, was an attentive reader of Darwin's ideas on the way that organisms are influenced by and adapt to their environment. Although Beatrix described the missionaries singing as doleful, Gounod's departure song is actually quite jolly. When Whistler heard it, apparently, according to uh, his pupil Verpal, he would certainly always steal away to an old stone bench half hidden behind a mass of lilac bushes to listen to it with intense pleasure. It's really rather intriguing to think of the proudly irreligious Whistler swept away by singing from a Roman Catholic seminary. But we should perhaps remember that Gounod was praised for the expressive colour of his music. His colleague, the composer Camille Saint-Saëns, even cast him in the role of a painter, calling Gounod's greatest concern his quest for, quote, a beautiful colour on the orchestral palette. He sought through study of timbre and new combinations the tones necessary for his brushes. And interestingly, for our garden perspective, Saint-Saëns in turn described the results as a magical flowering of the modern orchestra. We might note in the bygoing here that Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, had already proposed parallels between colours and musical notes. And Whistler, of course, had pursued this idea with his symphonies and harmonies in paint. But Whistler now argued at Rudubac that the subtle lines of lithography, his medium there for his songs on stone, conjured colour color in themselves and were thus expressive. So these little delicate touches, um, slightly soft edges and, and so on, that he explored with, with lithography were, in other words, ways to evoke colour, even though he's using black and white. By the 1890s, as Whistler reveled under the lilacs in Gounod's colourful music and made his songs on stone that evoked colour simply through black and white, sensitivity to the emotive power of music, including birdsong, had been highlighted by Charles Darwin as deriving from the very earliest stages of human evolution. Here's what Darwin says in another of his books on the expression of the emotions in man and animals, first published in 1872. Music has a wonderful power of recalling in a vague and indefinite manner these strong emotions which were felt during long past ages when, as is probable, our early progenitors courted each other by the aid of vocal tones. Powerful and mingled feelings evoked by music could, Darwin proposed, give rise to the sense of sublimity, the notion that Paul was discussing earlier in his paper. And it is in the context of this idea of sublimity that Darwin argues in the book on the expression of the emotions that it is probable that nearly the same emotions, but much weaker and far less complex, are felt by birds when the male pours forth the full volume of song in rivalry with other males to captivate the female. I'd like to set beside this description by Darwin of the emotional, primal and sublime nature of bird song, the anguished letter that Whistler sent Charles Freer in 1897 
in which, after his wife Beatrix's tragic early death, he describes in remarkably similar terms the singing of one of the Sharma birds that Freya had given her. He loved the wonderful bird you sent with such happy care from the distant land. And when she went, the strange wild dainty, dainty creature stood uplifted on the topmost perch and sang and sang as it had never sung before. A song of the sun and of joy and of my despair. Loud and ringing clear from the skies and louder, peal after peal until it became a marvel. The tiny beast torn by such glorious voice should live. And suddenly it was made known to me that in this mysterious magpie waif from beyond the temples of India, the spirit of my beautiful lady had lingered on its way. Whistler's claim here that Beatrix's spirit lingered in the, sing in the singing of her Sharma bird has traditionally been associated with his adherence to spiritualism. However, bearing in mind the Darwinian dimensions of his Paris garden that I've been tracing today, I'd like to suggest that it was also absolutely in keeping with his awareness of modern science, and indeed one of the elements that as an integral part of the Rue du Bac garden would have inspired his own songs on stone. Whistler's Paris garden was after all a totality. It's music, of birds, of monks singing, interweaving with its colours, scents, textures and open work structures would, I've suggested in this paper, have made it a Darwinian affective environment in an emotional as well as physical sense, to the extent that its birdsong became inextricably entwined with, for Whistler with his love for Beatrix. It was Beatrix, after all, who to all intents and purposes had made the garden with its latticework, porch, seats, jardiniere, etc., and its collection of singing birds. Whistler never used lithography again after Beatrix's death. And at her grave, he erected a trellis of his own for Clematis not to investigate the power of movement in such plants as Darwin had done by observing the growth of clematis and nasturtium on trellises in his garden at Down House, but rather to perpetuate the beauty that he associated with Beatrix. That essentially creative act of opening the mind to the inspiration of nature is, I suggest, perhaps actually Whistler's ultimate affinity with Darwin, when we remember that Darwin himself had walked in his garden to prompt creative thought on scientific problems. He had what he called a thinking path in his garden at Down House. Whistler may have argued in his 10 o'clock lecture that the true artist should look at nature's, quote, flower, not with the enlarging lens that he may gather facts for the botanist, end of quote, but Whistler's quest for beauty and harmony and his inspiration from his garden in so doing were surely less remote from 19th century science than has previously been assumed. In conclusion, I'd like to look very briefly to the science of our own day. A garden, after all, is an inherently marginal, transitional or boundary space. A space that mediates between the urban and the rural, the private home and the public street. And contemporary neuroscientists of our own times, that is, and psychologists also, such as Chris Langan, have identified marginal boundary or transition spaces as having the greatest emotive effect because their colors, shapes and textures are more diverse than spaces with a distinct identity of their own. Margins evoke both stronger emotions and more personal associations than other kinds of place or space. In this sense, Whistler's garden was in itself emotionally affective. Its music would simply have added to this. The art historian Suzanne Singletary has recently argued that Whistler's famous theory of art for art's sake did not, as she puts it, connote lack of meaning, but instead involved what she calls new levels and sources of meaning. 
listening and not just looking at listening to Whistler's Garden in the light of science, not just looking at it, is, I suggest, one of the ways to understand the meanings of his images of it. Sounding his garden enables us to see these as indeed logical heirs to the Renaissance and Baroque pastoral tradition, where nature and landscape had traditionally uh, been associated with piping shepherds, the music of Orpheus and so on, think of, of pastorals by Titian. Equally, the garden's delicate open work structures and music floating on the air look forward, I, I suggest, to the immersive creations of artists today, such as Fujiko Nakea and Harun Mirza. The immersive installations uh, that one finds, Venice Biennale, for example, uh, where one is surrounded by uh, fog or, or mist in, in a very uh, hands-on, in-depth way. Beatrix's work as garden maker and Whistler's pictures of the results, his songs on stone, take their place, therefore, in art's own evolution. Thank you. <laughs>